All right, and we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Feta. Today, we're going to be covering the Dixie Mafia. You guys requested this one, man. We're going to take a break from serial killers. We're going to go back to organized crime and public corruption. Let's get into it. This is going to be a good one. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Feta covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass murder investigation you see him reaching in his jacket you don't know and he's positioning been on february 13 2019 you're facing two counts of premeditated murder racketeering and rico conspiracy young, young slime life here and after referred to as ysl the defendants uh, six nine and then this is billy seiko right here now when they first started guys six nine ran with i'm a fed i'm watching this music video you know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes. AKA, Pooh Shicey violated. You're so ordered to stay away from the victim. Trapper Pooh Shicey arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds, Miami Strip Club, injured I mean, this one is person. The, this is the one that, that's going to fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, it happened at the gun range. Here's your boy, 42 Doug, right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. They can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm going to lock my trip to Right. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect two sent down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, the brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lynn Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay, trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're gonna go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, we're back. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It, man. Uh, guys, don't forget to like this video, okay? Subscribe on your way in. Okay, quick announcement before we get into the show. Number one, rumble.com slash fresh fit. Help us hit 100,000 on there. Second announcement. Guys, I wanna show y'all the channel real quick. As you guys can see, right, we got the uh, Fed Explains, the Merchant of Death. This is doing really well, man. So go ahead and watch this video, guys. If you guys want to know the real backstory on Victor Bout was that and why he was really a bad dude. I break this down. I go over the whole entire investigation that ended up putting him in jail. But, yes, this guy was trying to sell weapons to undercover DEA operatives that were trying to kill American soldiers that were combating uh, the Colombians and the Americans going against uh, the FARC. Okay, so, yeah, really wild stuff. We the L United States on this part because uh, that was a bad trade. Uh, also, guys, um, check out my whole serial killer playlist, man. I got a whole playlist on infamous serial killers for you guys. We got the Zodiac Killer. This is a four hour plus breakdown on the most notorious serial killer of all time. We got the Railroad Killer. I did this one uh, a couple weeks ago, almost two weeks ago now at this point. Obviously, we got the Night Stalker, Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, um, the Unabomber, right? Real famous one. Also, I got a complete breakdown on 9-11, guys. We go into the World Trade Center bombing, 9-11, and the FBI investigation, Osama bin Laden, uh, his backstory. You know, a lot of people didn't know that he was a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. His family was worth billions of dollars <laughs> uh, because the bin Laden family uh, was responsible for a lot of the construction in Saudi Arabia. And then we go into the conspiracy theories with 9-11 as well, where we went ahead and broke down the documentary, The New Pearl Harbor. Um, and I give my take on it as well. And, you know, we covered, you know, a bunch of different things with, um, you know, Robin, uh, Shankello Robinson's murder down there in Mexico. Uh, we also go ahead and cover, we got the clips, right? And obviously you got all, all the videos you guys have come to learn and love, such as, um, you know, YNW Melly, YSL, the Old Block Rico, the takeoff shooting, Casanova, 6ix9ine, Tory Lanez. We'll also be covering, you know, K Flock. All the stuff, R. Kelly, all that stuff is there, guys. So be sure to subscribe to the channel. Definitely one of the best true crime channels on YouTube by far because there's no one else that has my experience giving y'all this kind of sauce on the internet, man. Uh, anyway, with that said, I got a special guest in the house. Christina, why don't you introduce yourself to the people? Hi, I'm Christina. Um, if you guys have any cases or tell me the whatever state you guys are in, contact Fed at 1811 on IG. Bam. She manages that Instagram guy. She helps me out behind the scenes. Um, she went ahead. I done a marker for you on this one. She went ahead and uh, Dumb, Dumb, got me the Young Dolph documents, guys. And we got some more documents coming in. We made some connections, and uh, the Young Dolph case is definitely going to be done very soon. We got exclusive documents that other people don't have. Um, Christina's in the process of gathering all the documents. I think they got a court date in January, right? That's why we're waiting. 
they have a court date this week and then they have uh, two more in January. But what I can't, I don't want to say. Okay, that's stuff, that's yeah. fine. Some some uh, yeah. some stuff that we can't disclose yet. We will on the episode, but yeah. Um, Christina and Zena went up to Memphis and went and got the documents themselves. So shout out to both of them for helping me out. Also, quick announcements. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do the next serial killer. I'm gonna cover guys is BTK, aka Dennis Raider. Got gotcha. y'all. You guys have been asking for that one. That one's coming very soon. That dude is fucking crazy. Um, definitely had <laughs> Kansas, the worst serial killer, definitely in Wichita. Slash Kansas slash well Kansas is history okay N- let alone one of the most um, notorious serial killers in U.S. history and then um, I'm also gonna go ahead and cover uh, um, the guy that got arrested FTX um, Samuel Friedman Fre- Friedman uh, I got his indictment I got his documents I'm also going to be covering that one very soon as well and I know you guys have been asking about those college shootings I'm gonna be covering that as well um, Sam uh, let's see what was his name again Let me it's check the email. what was that. Check the Instagram. Instagram? Okay. Uh it's uh yeah, Samuel Bankman Freed. Sorry, guys. Yeah, Samuel Bankman Freed. SBF. Um, I'm gonna be covering his case uh as well, uh coming up. So, and as you guys know, Tory Lanes right now is in the middle of the trial. Meg the Stallion took the stand yesterday. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and look at you know the the court transcripts and go ahead and go through some of the videos of how her testimony went, but uh I'll probably do a reaction to the trial as well. For you guys, so we got some big things coming on for All right, guys. So, anyway, with that said, guys, today we're going to be covering the Dixie Mafia. Man, this is organized crime and public corruption at its finest. Um, a lot of you guys may be familiar with Biloxi, a uh, very famous um, gambling slash tourist town, but it wasn't always like that. And we're going to go ahead into the dark backstory of um, Biloxi, and uh, yeah, we're going to cover the Dixie Mafia. This has been a request. Um, this is a really good organized crime case when it comes to public corruption. Uh, we've covered a couple of public corruption cases on this uh, channel, um, but I'm excited to get back into it. So as usual, we're going to break down a documentary from the FBI Files, man. One of my favorite documentaries, as you guys know. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get right into it, ladies and gentlemen. Biloxi, Mississippi. A quiet southern town with a burning core of corruption. In 1987, its secret burst violently to the surface, leaving two prominent citizens dead and ripping the top off a grand conspiracy. On Mississippi's Gulf Coast, a judge and his politician wife are murdered in their home. The killer left few clues. So this is our, guys, off rip. We got a judge and a political figure being murdered in their own homes. You already know this reeks of some craziness, but once you guys see the reason why and who is behind it, it's about to be wild. It looked like a professional hit, and the investigation led nowhere. But the FBI refused to give up. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Until we could prove that federal laws had been broken, our hands were tied. It would take years to break the conspiracy of silence and reveal the tangled tale of corruption. Biloxi, Mississippi, Monday, September 14th, 1987. It was a typically warm summer night in this quiet Gulf Coast town. The workday was over, and most residents had retreated to the tranquility of their homes. Like most of their neighbors, State Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were unwinding after a long day. Vincent Sherry was a prominent judge in Biloxi. Margaret was making plans to run for mayor, just so you guys know where Biloxi is, right? Because it's it's important to kind of know where the area is. 
So here is Mississippi right here. Um, okay. So, boom. So here we go. Here's Mississippi, right? You come all the way down here, and you can see Biloxi is right here, right on the coast. Okay, as you can see, Hard Rock, a hotel and casino. Um, it's it's a vacation destination now, but it wasn't always like that. And you guys are going to see what ended up um, leading to this very soon. Okay. Both were fixtures at Biloxi's social and community functions. They were a happy couple who had raised three grown children. Tomorrow they planned to visit their daughter out of state. But their life together seemed ideal. They were just settling in for the night when an unexpected visitor came to the door. What are you doing here with us? and brought their perfect world to an end. Merc, both of them. <laughs> I didn't give a fuck. The Sherrys were supposed to be with their daughter. So no one realized anything was wrong until two days later when the judge failed to show up in court on Wednesday, September 16th. Oh yeah, Mississippi is hot, guys. And this is the 80s. This is before, you know, Central AC was a huge thing. So this is the late 80s. Calls to the Sherry's home went unanswered. After the beep. His colleagues at the court phoned Pete Halat, Vincent Sherry's friend and former law partner. Morning, Pete Hallett. But he hadn't seen or heard from the judge either. Well, he's supposed to be in court. When did he leave? I don't know. No, wait, you let me call him at home and I'll, I'll figure out where he is. After he left a concerned message on the Sherry's answering machine, Halat felt he'd better check on his friend personally. Oh, I got the machine. Judge! Judge, it's Pete. They're looking for you in court. Is everything okay? On his way out, he asked his junior partner, Charles Legier, to ride with him. Charlie! I need some help, so... Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'll give you a call back, okay? Yeah. Bye-bye. I figure if we go together, the two of us... Hmm. Smart. Bring in a witness. As they drove, Legier tried to make conversation. Well, that seemed distant, perhaps concerned about the judge. Both of the Sherry's cars stood in the driveway. Well, the car's here. I don't like it. I don't like it. Well, the car's here. It's supposed to be in court. Halat asked Legier to go to the house while he asked a neighbor if she'd seen the couple. Just go ahead. Legier rang the doorbell, but no one answered. He saw that the last two morning newspapers hadn't been picked up. Up. Oh. And just to let y'all know, um, you know, obviously as a judge, wife as a politician, you're not missing a newspaper, guys. Remember, in 1987, there was no other way really to get the news besides conventional television. A lot of times it would have to be cable TV, unless, unless I don't even think CNN was like a thing really at this point where they had 24/7 news. Okay. Um, or you were watching the broadcast 
through, you know, you're watching like the news broadcast that came in throughout the day, you know, maybe 8 a.m. news and the 5 p.m. news and maybe some late later evening news around 7 or 9 p.m. But in general, newspapers were a way of life back then, guys. I know nowadays it's like, what the fuck? A newspaper, magazines, books. Ha! Huh? No one needs that. Stupid. But back in the 80s. That was a big deal. So for him to see two days of newspapers not being picked up, that's that's yeah, what the hell's going on here? All right. And I know a lot of you young bucks are like, what the hell are you talking about, Myron? But yes, guys, newspapers were a big fucking deal back then. I remember myself, my dad, he he couldn't get through the day unless he had the, the morning paper. It's just a thing. The neighbor told Halat she hadn't seen the Sherrys for a couple of days, which she thought was odd since both of their cars were in the driveway. When Legere tried the Sherry's door, he found it unlocked. Something wasn't right. Hey, Pete! Pete! Yeah, I was uh, just knocking on it and the door opened up. Palat, concerned by the open door, cautiously stepped inside. A few steps in, he made the gruesome discovery. Judge Sherry had been gunned down in his own home. What's wrong? They called the police. Authorities arrived to find the body of Vincent Sherry at the front of the house. In the back bedroom, they discovered Margaret. Because the couple was so prominent, the murder investigation became top priority. Detectives contacted the FBI's Biloxi field office. Though the FBI would not yet be officially involved, they offered the use of their agents and forensic laboratory. All right, so let me break this down for y'all real quick. When you're in a small town, right? Remember, this is before Biloxi blew up and became the city that is it is now being a vacation destination. Um, it was still in an, its infant stages. When when you're a federal agent, right, and you're assigned to a small city like this, all the law enforcement know each other. So if something crazy happens, something big happens in town, everybody is going to come in and work together, all right? The feds are going to come in and help out the state. Now, remember, guys, it's a murder case, right? And I've explained to you guys before, murder cases, nine out of 10 times, unless there's some other type of federal crime being involved, right? Let's say a bank robbery, for example, typically are state-led investigations, all right? Premeditated murder, you know, murder in the second degree where it might not necessarily have been premeditated, almost always falls to the state. The feds don't come in unless the state asks for the help. Or the state needs the help, whether it might be, like they said in the documentary, um, you know, a forensic lab. They need manpower. Uh, you know, they have a working relationship where, hey, listen, I got a buddy who's an FBI agent and you got a homicide detective and they just want their help. You know, he'll request, uh, hey, can I get some assistance or whatever? Maybe they want a profile on the killer, right? If it's a serial killer or someone crazy and there's a pattern of the killing and they want to figure out what type of individual he may be, right? So all of these things come into play. But typically... When there's a FBI office, a Homeland office, an ATF office, DEA office, etc., in a smaller area, they work together a lot of the time. So it wouldn't be uncommon, right, even though this is going to be a state-led investigation off-rip, for the FBI to come in and assist, especially with something like this that has a lot of uh, media coverage, right? You got a judge and you got a political figure being murdered in their home. Well, yeah, qu quite clearly, there's some nefarious activity behind that. So, um, you know, at the, at the onset of the investigation, the FBI is probably going to come in um, because it's a smaller town. Everyone knows each other. So this isn't uncommon. But in a major city, yeah, it's a little bit different. You know, unless there's good relationships between the agencies, you're, you're not going to see camaraderie like this level. Inside, the police began scouring the crime scene for clues. They conducted blood spatter analysis to determine projectile angles. If they could figure out where the murderer had stood when he fired the shots, they might be able to reconstruct the crime. Okay. Inspector Robert Burris, a crime technician with the Biloxi Police Department, helped process the scene. 
he discovered a possible clue in the den. There was blood trailing from his feet, actually going down between his legs a little ways, uh, back to where he was laying. There was blood spatter on um, a double sliding glass door that was right beyond his head. And further examination in this room, I found some um, small pieces of foam rubber. Burris didn't see where the foam rubber could have come from. A search of the house led him to one conclusion. Now this foam rubber had to have been brought into the house. We examined every piece of material in this house and every room of the house, all pillows, mattresses, everything else. There's no foam rubber tore up in this house. It was brought into the house. It does have gunshot residue on it. And basically about the only way it can get there is for a bullet to be fired through it. For Burris, the significance of the foam rubber was obvious. The killer had used a homemade silencer. All right, so guys, that's a huge red flag. The fact that they use the silencer tells you, okay, we're not dealing with some amateurs here, right? Number one, silencers aren't necessarily easy to get. And then the fact that there was rubber foam means it was a homemade one, which means that this guy had a serious, um, you know, if, if that doesn't show premeditation, I don't know what does, right? Clearly, they had to get in. They knew the, statu the, the, the status of the individuals that they were targeting. They had to get it done in a way where it wouldn't be loud. It's a quiet neighborhood. So all these, you know, different uh, steps that the killer took, right, show what premeditation, right? the type of figures that they were going after, the want to keep it uh, nice and quiet because it's a residential neighborhood. All this stuff factors into it. So the police at this point know that they're not dealing with some amateur idiot. Whoever they're dealing with is a planned and seasoned professional. Investigators dusted for fingerprints but found none of any value. They found nine spent 22 caliber shell casings from a semi-automatic pistol, as well as the bullets used to murder the Sherrys. The position of the shells indicated that the shots had been fired in rapid succession. But most striking was how well the killer had covered his tracks. Nothing at the scene pointed to the killer's identity. So what do you think? He did his job well, and his mission was clear. The lack of evidence in this house, such as uh, items stolen, uh, a struggle occurring, the absence of forced entry, uh, no ransacking going on in the house whatsoever, a person came there for one thing. That was to kill the two Sherrys. Special Agent Keith Bell from the Biloxi FBI field office agreed that this was a professional job. The Sherrys had been assassinated. The crime scene appeared to be very limited as far as evidence remaining, which meant it was well planned, well executed, and professionally done. A uh, small caliber weapon had been used. Uh, the uh, foam rubber indicated that uh, perhaps a silencer had also been used and the Sherry's had been uh, shot in the head. So uh, it, it seemed to be a very professional job. Now, also, this might seem familiar for you guys. You guys know I went ahead and covered another podcast, right? Um, <laughs> uh, a guy that actually committed a hit and he used a book called Hitman, right, to commit the murders. And I actually had a got, got a copy of the book here. Let me say, Christina, can you try to dig it up? It's somewhere. Um, and he followed the instructions in that book, and he ended up almost getting away with the murder. Yet the police, when they searched his house, found that book, and he and obviously a lot of the things that they found at the crime scene matched the book. So that was a big. Uh, how do I say this? That was an L for him, for sure. Because the next thing you know. So he and he ended up going to jail. But um, this is also very interesting to see that we got another professionally done hit in this one. But go check out that episode, guys. It was probably one of the worst murder for hire cases uh, I've covered. You know, ended up where a wife and a child were, were killed by a crazy ass husband. Uh, go check it out. It's on Fed it on the documentary breakdown channel. Uh, playlist. Yeah, but, uh, we have
A multi-agency task force was assembled with Special Agent Keith Bell among its members. Investigators would... And this isn't uncommon, guys. Like I said before, in small towns, the feds and the state typically work fairly closely together, and task force is a common thing. And if you got a big case like this, where you got prominent figures, uh, public officials, etc., getting killed, and the way that they got killed with a professional hit, a.k.a. a hitman with almost no evidence, yeah, everyone's going to be all over it. Spend days processing the crime scene. They grappled with a single question. Why had the Sherrys been murdered? That was one of the main questions, uh, that being why were both Judge Sherry and Margaret Sherry. Shout out to Christina. She found the book. This is a book right here, guys. <laughs> uh, Hitman, okay? A technical manual for independent contractors. Crazy stuff. And real quick, I'll show y'all the episode that I'm talking sure. about in general here. Um, so if you go to Fed 1811, it's right here. Um, you go over to Crime Documentary Breakdowns, and it is right here. This band, uh, this band book led to the murder for hire. And um, oh, hold on, my bad. It's not even on the screen. Let me share a screen with y'all. This is it right here. Okay. Uh, and this this was Examine crazy, the records for that and we broke it down. Really good episode. Um, and the book ended up getting banned after from a lawsuit. So, yeah. Anyway, timestamp surrender. You know, definitely go check it out. Go enjoy. We got more breakdowns like that on uh, Fed it. But anyway, let's get back to the episode here. Oh, hold on. He murdered because it was fairly obvious that Judge Sherry could have been killed during his morning or afternoon jogs around the neighborhood. Uh, so it was a real mystery why Margaret had been killed. Investigators believe the answer might lie in the controversy over Biloxi's future. Some civic leaders hope to transform the sleepy southern town on Mississippi's Gulf Coast into a flashy resort where casinos would attract tourist dollars. But with strip clubs already established in town, Margaret Sherry felt Biloxi's small town charms were threatened. And the casinos would attract a criminal element. As a candidate for mayor, she had made powerful political enemies by trying to keep gambling out. Hmm. So there you go. That's a clue right there, guys. She didn't want Biloxi to become what it is now. OK, a gambling hub, because obviously, I mean, let's be honest here. Anytime you introduce gambling, what do you introduce? You introduce a lot of degeneracy with gambling comes strip clubs, bars, um, prostitution, uh, drug trafficking, uh, criminal activity in general just comes alongside gambling. It is what it is, guys. You look at places like Las Vegas, you look at any type of place that's huge with gambling, some type of criminal activity isn't far behind. OK, so. Um, she didn't want that. So obviously there's a lot of money to be made in gambling and these types of vi uh, vices. So I'm not surprised that she would be a target. Agent Bell wondered if Margaret was killed to silence her protests. Margaret had been so outspoken politically in the community. Uh, she was known to be anti-gambling. And uh, if elected mayor in 1989, she had planned to close down the remaining strip clubs in Biloxi. So there was always the possibility that she might have been the target rather than Judge Sherry. The task force would investigate Margaret's political enemies, but first they'd question the Sherry's friends and neighbors. Someone in the neighborhood must have seen something. But even people who'd known the Sherry's for years were reluctant to talk fearing the specter of Biloxi's emerging criminal underworld. The Sherry murders brought a dark cloud over the city of Biloxi. Uh, many of the citizens in Biloxi were uh, afraid to openly express their opinions. They saw that Margaret Sherry, who had been quite vocal and quite outspoken in political circles, had ended up dead, as had her prominent husband, Judge Sherry. So many citizens uh, after these murders uh, were hesitant even to be interviewed by FBI agents or by local police officers because they basically 
did not want their names tied in to anything to do with this case. If people wouldn't talk to the authorities, perhaps they would talk to Lynn Spazito, the Sherry's daughter. After being notified of her parents' murders, Lynn rushed to Biloxi from her home in North Carolina. Determined to find justice, she questioned everyone in the neighborhood. One family friend. Hmm, that makes me wonder if the police asked her, hey, can you, you know, do, so, do a little bit of snooping for us or whatever? This is the 80s, man. Times were different back then. Uh, but, yeah, you ain't going to be able to turn away uh, a very sad daughter about her parents' death. Gave her a crucial piece of information. He described a suspicious car and driver in the neighborhood on the night of the murders. Oh, here we go. She took the lead to the police. They identified a man who had seen a suspicious Ford Fairmont driving in front of the Sherry home on Monday night, September 14th, 1987. Investigators tried to determine the identity of the driver based on the witness's description. Their search came up empty. But a few days later, not far from the Sherry's home, investigators found an abandoned car, a Ford Fairmont. Oh, okay. A check on the vehicle's identification number showed it had been reported stolen the day before the murders. Police also learned that the tags on the car were not registered to the car. Realizing More clues. Realizing that this vehicle was probably the killer's getaway car. Investigators towed it to a police garage to examine it further. Somewhere in the car, they hoped to find a key to the killer's identity. Less than a week after the brutal murders of the Luxie couple Vince and Margaret Sherry, investigators received their first promising lead. They recovered an abandoned car matching the one witnesses described seeing the night of the murders. After contacting agent Keith Bell about the discovery, investigators processed the car for clues. Inspector Robert Burris found something peculiar. I was processing this vehicle and one of the things I noted, the dome light had been dismantled and the bulb taken out of it. In other words, if you open the door, you ain't got no light. Both of the sun visors were in the down position. Whether you're riding around daytime or nighttime, you ain't gonna be able to see the people's face in it very well. Investigators believed more than ever that this was the car used by the Sherry's killer. Anything found inside it was labeled, packaged, and shipped yeah. to the FBI labs in Washington, D.C. but FBI lab examiners would find nothing of evidentiary value. After Agent Bell arrived, he examined the license tag more closely. He discovered it had its own story to tell. It was determined that the tag on the Ford Fairmont had been stolen from an abandoned vehicle in 1984, actually three years before these murders occurred. So what it meant was someone had removed the license plate, likely in 1984, had kept the license plate, and then when this major crime in the city of Biloxi was uh, to occur, they pulled it off the shelf, so to speak. Hmm, so that's weird. Uh, so you're telling me that they could potentially plan this thing a year prior. <laughs> With no other solid evidence, investigators hoped that following the trail of the stolen tag might lead to the killer. It was traced to an apartment complex where the original car had been abandoned three years earlier. Investigators contacted the apartment manager, who told them that prior to having the vehicle towed, he called a friend to come and strip it for parts. The manager's friend, was a man that agents knew by name and reputation. Biloxi locksmith Lenny Sweatman. He was the last person to be seen near the car. 
Sweatman belonged to a loosely organized group of criminals the FBI was investigating in connection with another case. The group oh, here we go. Group was known as the Dixie Mafia. Bam. Now we've been able to effectively link a vehicle that was more than likely used in a murder of a public official. No, well, actually two public officials and um, and link it back to an organized criminal group. Now the Bureau can kind of come in and get involved because they were already investigating them for organized criminal activity. Now they're able to go ahead and add murder to the criminal activity, guys, as a as a, as a part of the, uh, you know, typically when you're doing organized crime. They typically look at it from a racketeering standpoint. Murder is considered a crime that can fall under racketeering, okay? A.K.A. Rico. FBI agent Keith Bell had connected the car used in the Sherry killings to Lenny Sweatman. Now, Bell wondered if the Dixie Mafia was linked to the Sherry murders. If Sweatman had a part in it, Bell believed that other Dixie Mafia members couldn't be far behind. He began looking into Sweatman's associates. What that meant to us immediately, uh, those of us familiar with the criminal associations on the coast, was that if Lenny Sweatman was involved in getting the tag for the hit car, then quite likely his close personal friend and longtime associate Mike Gillich, the strip club owner in Biloxi, might also be involved in these murders. That's all right. Sometimes you know how it is. Oh, thanks. Oh, be All right. Gillich, who owns mm, a strip club owner, also being linked to the person who is involved with the fucking vehicle. Guys, more clues. And would a strip club owner want a casino to be opened up in his town? More than likely, yes. Three strip clubs in Biloxi was well known to local law enforcement. He was currently under investigation by the FBI in connection with a Dixie Mafia operation known as the Lonely Heart Scam. See, he gets to it. But Special Agent Bell needed a thread that connected the two investigations together. He started by familiarizing himself with the Lonely Heart Scam. It was run out of Angola prison in Louisiana by a man named Kirksey Nix, the incarcerated kingpin of the Dixie Mafia. No, the first model. Nix would run ads in gay magazines, asking for money to help fictional gay men get out of trouble with the law. Through the scam, Nix was hoping to generate enough money to solve his own legal problems. <laughs> Yo, the finesse. Yo, so he was out here, right? Once again, man, the male thirst for sex is so powerful that a dude in prison can go ahead and scam and say, yo, guys, I'm gay. I need help. I'll I'll write you letters, blah, blah, blah. I'll give you some attention. Just pay me some money. This is OnlyFans before OnlyFans even existed. <laughs> this is coming from a dude out in jail. <laughs> Making a bunch of money for his own legal fees. Wild. What a finesse. He was serving a life sentence for murder. From his jail cell at Angola, he coordinated what we've been referring to as the homosexual scam, which generated hundreds. And remember also, guys, homosexuality back in the late 80s was not accepted, okay? There was no gay marriage and none of that other stuff. This is all newer stuff in the past five to ten years. I mean, gay marriage was only approved, I think, what, what in the last decade or so? So... Guys, um, for him, this was kind of like a way to make money under the table because there was still, you know, the, the LGBT community wasn't as out there and pronounced as they are now, okay? And here is your boy right here, Kirksey Nix, okay? Here he is. Uh, he's still alive, is the, is the former leader of the Dixie Mafia. He's uh, suspected, oh, my bad. Uh, he's suspe he uh, was a suspect in the assassination attempt on Sheriff Bufer, uh, Buford P Pusser, and in the death of Buford's wife on August 12, 1967, Nix has repeatedly refused to com comment about Pusser's claims that he was one of his wife's killers. That's probably what put him in jail in the 80s. In the 1972, Nix was convicted of murdering Frank Corso, a New Orleans grocery executive, in a break-in at Corso's home and began serving a life sentence without parole. Nix was later involved in 1987 murder for hire, killing of Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife, Margaret, in Biloxi, Mississippi. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. 
But here he is. Here's his uh here's his Wikipedia page. Let me see if we can get uh here he is right here. This is him, guys. Kirksey <laughs> Nix. Okay. Former leader of Dixie Mafia. What's so funny, Christina? His hair. Oh, his hair? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like the back in the day the 70s. Took thousands of dollars from individuals around the country and as well as some people in Canada. Uh, with this money, what he... did he call it? Did he call it the homo scam? Homosexual scam. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is amazing to me because that's just like, he really. Well, this documentary is from the early 2000s, so they didn't go fuck back that either. <laughs> no. late, late 90s, early 2000s. So <laughs> it's too hundreds of thousands of dollars what we've been referring to as the homosexual scam. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, they would never be able to talk about the imagine the FBI today called the homosexual scam. They would never be able to fucking call it that shit now, man. Times have changed. <laughs> Which generated hundreds of thousands of dollars from individuals around the country and as well as some people in Canada. Uh, with this money, he intended to buy his way out or attempt to buy his way out of his uh, Louisiana prison sentence. Believing that they were helping gay men out of trouble, people who read the magazine ads would wire or mail money to a nearby Western Union. Nix would then call his contact on the outside, Mike Gillich. Yes. Gillich would then dispatch his bagman to retrieve the money. Right. See you Gillich made sure that the scam money was distributed to Dixie Mafia members and safely stashed away for Kirksey Nix. Take care. All right, so this is very interesting. So here's this. So the scheme is you got Kirsty Nix who's in prison, right, for murder. He's going ahead and doing some scam with, uh, you know, and targeting the the gay community, right, from a victim mindset. Like, hey, I I, I need help, blah blah blah, help us out, blah blah blah. Gets a bunch of money wired to him. Then he tells Gillich, who's on the outside, owns the strip clubs, right. He's getting a bunch of wires. Hey, well, he runs a strip club. It's a cash business. Who cares, right? Then he says, bag man. Goes gets the money, and then he probably gets a cut of it, and then he stores it for Nick's for his legal defense. Smart scheme right here, my friends. That's a bunch of scamming right there. <laughs> I'm trying to see like what else he did with it. In the coming months, investigators developed more evidence in the Lonely Heart scam, but still had no direct link between these conspirators and the Sherry's killers. A year into the investigation. The murder case threatened to stop. Ah, oh, hi. Come in. As the yeah. years stretched oh, to 16 you. months, the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Sposito, grew increasingly frustrated. Now, you said on the phone that you've been looking In January 1989, she hired a private investigator to rev up the inquest into her parents' murder. He said he could make out the math. And I'll give him a call and I'll be on this case this afternoon. Shout out to her daughter for not giving up. The family had wanted very much to have a quick resolution to the case, but by uh, early 1989, there'd still been no arrest. And of course, at this point, the FBI had not formally uh, entered the case. The lack of official FBI involvement hampered Bell's investigation. So when the private investigator paid him a visit, Bell welcomed his assistance, hoping they could... Okay, let me break this down for y'all real quick about how the FBI works. Guys, the FBI is a very bureaucratic... And it's kind of funny because it's called the Federal Bureau of Investigation. But the bureaucracy helps them from going ahead and getting their fucking work done, okay? They have a lot of red tape. It's very difficult for them to do their job a lot of the times. And what I mean by this is the FBI can't actually commit serious resources to an investigation unless they have a case opened. However. It's a pain in the ass for them to get an investigation open. They need a supervisor. They need a bunch of approvals. They need to have some kind of serious nexus, blah, blah, blah. It's bullshit. So for them, right, for him to actually commit the time he wants to and commit the resources he wants to and the effort that he wants to, he needs to actually formally open up an FBI investigation, okay? And as you guys can see, it's a murder case. It's not the FBI's main thing. Now, he's been able to make some links here and there with, yo, it might may or may not be related to the Dixie Mafia because a stolen car was tied back to a guy that's associated to another guy. That's not strong enough to open up a case. So 
for him, his hands were kind of tied in this case. All right. And that's kind of one of the things that sucks about the FBI. That a lot of people don't know. And I know because I work with them very closely many times is that they can't actually do anything unless they open a full fledged criminal investigation for them to open up a full fledged criminal investigation. It's a lot of fucking red tape, man. It's a pain in the ass versus when I was working as an agent for HSI, it's fairly easy to open up a case. Hey, boss, I got this going on, blah, blah, blah. You tell your GS-14, your supervisor, I want to open up this case, right? Even if it's to mirror, right, a state and local case, maybe you're assisting there. You open up a case so that you can attribute your hours and your efforts to something. Like, you know, you could, you you run with it. You know, they're not going to sit there and be like, oh, well, you can't open a case because X, Y, Z and all this other BS. No, not nearly as much red tape as the FBI when it comes to opening up cases and uh, committing resources. So um, this is something that that kind of sucks with the bureau, and it's wild because this is the '80s. They have even more; uh, their hands are even more tied nowadays, guys, than back then. Share information. The two were so the C the 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 private investigator, aka the PI, comes in with some of the information that he's gotten right during the course of his private investigation on behalf of the daughter. Old acquaintances from the private investigator's days in law enforcement. Since Agent Bell was unable to act officially, the private investigator would pursue a lead that looked promising. He would interview another Angola inmate. The private investigator and Bell hoped the inmate at Angola could finally link the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. He uh, met with all the right people, and because of his knowledge of the Dixie Mafia uh, and from what he had learned from law enforcement authorities on the coast, he did go over to Angola and did talk to the right person over there. The inmate's name was Bobby Joe Fabian. He was another known member of the Dixie Mafia, doing time for kidnapping and shooting a state trooper. Fabian claimed he had not been involved in the Sherry murders. But he had learned that fellow inmate Kirksey Nix had been. Fabian told the private investigator that Nix had had Judge Sherry killed because Sherry had allegedly stolen money from Nix's Lonely Heart scam. That wasn't all. He said Nix had been told of the theft by none other than Pete Halat, Sherry's former law partner. Halat. The man who oh shit guys for you guys that, that that uh may have forgotten halat is the guy that went with you know his clerk or whoever his employee to go look at the house a couple of days after the murders who delivered the eulogy at the sherry's funeral was now implicated in their murders wow it'd be the ones closest to you that end up getting you Halat officially represented Nix on legal matters, but Fabian said Halat's role in the Lonely Heart scam was criminal, not legal. Halat was one of the people receiving money from Nix for safekeeping through Mike Gillich's bag man. Oh man! So there, right? That right there, guys, looks to be the link between the murders, because you got the bag man bringing the money to the lawyer. For safekeeping for Kirksey Nix. Don't forget to pick up next week at the other place. And the ties between the outlaw and the lawyer went deep. Kirksey Nix's girlfriend and accomplice, Larray Sharp, worked in Halat's office. Oh! More negative links coming in. See, I could see the conspiracy coming in here, the inner web of, of fuckery, right? Fabian said both LaRay Sharp and Pete Halat were stashing money from the scam in a safe deposit box for Kirksey Nix. And he said the amount had reached six figures. Thanks to Fabian, the link between the murders and the Lonely Heart scam had been made. And uh, $100,000, guys, in 1987, I'm looking at it here, right? They said six figures. So we'll just go with 100,000. It's worth 162,000. Sorry. It's worth $162,000 today. Okay. Or no, excuse me. 
hundred thousand dollars in nineteen ninety-seven is equivalent in purchasing power to about two hundred sixty-two thousand uh, dollars today. And here it is, right here. So yeah, that's wild. A uh, damn over doubled. And not only had Fabian given investigators a possible motive for the killings, he was also able to supply the name of the alleged hitman. Oh shit! An ex-con named John Ransom, who was believed to be living in John Ransom. That sounds like a like a criminal's name. <laughs> Georgia. But tracking down Ransom would take time. Anytime law enforcement uh, people get together and start talking about notorious Dixie Mafia members, John Ransom comes up quite early in the conversation. He's a longtime alleged hitman for the Dixie Mafia. In August of 1989, two years after the Sherry murders, Agent Bell now had enough evidence to warrant a full FBI investigation into the killings. So it took him two years to be able to get the information just to open up a case. And he probably went to the U.S. Attorney's Office to go ahead and um, get someone to secure prosecution. Hey, I'll work the case and I'll prosecute on my head once you develop all the information. Accompanied by the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Sposito, he approached the United States Attorney and the FBI with a demand to officially open the case. So with the tying in of the scam to the murders, we knew we had some federal violations involved. We have uh, wire fraud, we had mail fraud, and we perhaps had a hit. Wire fraud and mail fraud, guys, are some of the easiest charges to prove federally. Um, all you got to prove is that, hey, you got money and or received some type of wire through mail or through wire through deceit or fraud, done, they got you. Next thing you know, it's a federal charge. FBI, open up! Fairly easy to prove. Man traveling from Georgia to Mississippi to kill the Sherry's. Uh, it was decided to open an official FBI investigation and join with local authorities in the investigation. By now, however, suspect Pete Halat Judge Sherry's former law partner had been elected mayor of Biloxi with a key suspect in such a high position. Well, that changes things significantly because now not only are you going after a lawyer, right? You're going after the mayor, potentially, which is a big fucking deal, guys. You need to get a lot of approvals to go after public officials in high authority positions. Investigators encountered new roadblocks. It became very difficult for the FBI to share all of its information with the local authorities. Yep, because technically they work for him. <laughs> we are not uh, saying that the local police were corrupt. What we are saying is that Mayor Halat put his own people in as director of public safety and as police chief. So we were somewhat circumspect on what we, we shared uh, with local authorities during that time period. In August of 1989, as investigators attempted to unravel the truth about the Sherry's murders, informant Bobby Joe Fabian made a surprise move. He told his story about the Sherry murders to the TV news. Fabian hoped Oh that my God, when cloud chasing goes fucking wrong. So, obviously, you can assume whatever the hell he tells the news, now the public's going to know, and they're going to be like, oh, the police are probably going to be on us now. Holy. By bringing attention to himself, Kirksey Nix would be less likely to have him killed for cooperating with authorities. Along with the report, the station broadcast a mugshot of John Ransom the alleged hitman in the Sherry case. Oh, my God. <laughs> when Charles Legere, Peter Latt's junior partner, saw the photo, it surprised him. He recalled seeing Ransom outside the Sherry Halat law offices a few weeks before the murder. Oh, shit. Hello. 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 Legere shared his information with the task force. Mm -hmm. 
Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department took Legere's statement. Legere said the reason he remembered Ransom was Ransom stepped off of a curve and came up to him and asked him where it's been Sherry's office at. When Legere was interviewed, Jimmy. he recalled there was something unusual about the way Ransom stepped off of the curve. Well, could you imagine some fucking guy comes up to you? Hey, uh, well, I meet with uh, your boss. Uh, you know, I look a little kind of, I know I'm messed up looking and I'm limping and stuff. And I may or may not have killed people in the past. But yeah, the, the show me where he's at. Like, bro, what the hell? You're going to definitely remember that. <laughs> oh, man. Ransom had a prosthesis on one leg. Investigators learned that Ransom was now in a Georgia prison serving time for another murder. When questioned about the Sherry murders, he refused to cooperate. Oh. As Cook further questioned Legere about the day he and Halat had found the bodies, an important detail emerged. Legere remembered that Halat had walked into the Sherry's living room, seen Judge Sherry's body, and said, Vince and Margaret are dead. Oh! Cook relayed this to Agent Bell. What the hell? Oh shit! Oh shit! So he only saw one of the dead bodies, but knew that both were done. My friends, that is what you would call a clue. And what was interesting was that Margaret's body was in the far back bedroom of the residence. And according to Chuck Legere, Pete Halat did not have time uh, other than to briefly enter the front of the house and would have no way of knowing that Margaret's body was also in the very back bedroom. In October of 1989, two years after the murders, Agent Bell knew Halat was involved, but he still lacked enough evidence for an arrest. Even so... So now you're investigating the, the mayor of the city. <laughs> oh, Lord. He felt it was time to confront Mayor Halat. It would be a quiet warning, man to man. And I let Mayor Halat know that I thought his knowledge of the Sherry murders was much greater than uh, what he had shared with law enforcement authorities up to that point. And I recall also telling him that the FBI would continue working on this case until it was totally solved. Uh, my recollection is he smiled and did not have much else to say. Yeah, he's a lawyer, bro. He ain't gonna say nothing. <laughs> he's like, fuck the police. As a lawyer, Halad knew Bell would need more concrete evidence in order to secure a conviction. What he likely didn't realize was the depth of Bell's commitment to bring him to justice. Yeah, shout out to this agent, man. He was very persistent and did a fantastic job. We're gonna uh, we're gonna see some more of that here in a second. Three years had passed since Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were murdered in their three years. Biloxi, Mississippi home. FBI Special Agent Keith Bell had connected the killings to members of the Dixie Mafia and to Judge Sherry's friend and one-time law partner, Pete Halat. The alleged trigger man, John Ransom, was refusing to talk. In January of 1990, Agent Bell and Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department drove to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary to question another possible accomplice. This is special A man named Bill Rhodes. Rhodes, a known associate of John Ransom, was willing to cooperate. Uh, informers is how you build cases, my friends. He told them that in early 1987, Ransom had contacted him about driving the getaway car in a crime to take place in southern Mississippi. Ransom had said a judge would be murdered and that the pay was $10,000. There were certain promises made to Rhodes that, by Ransom that I know certain people in Biloxi that if you'll help me on... 
ten thousand dollars in nineteen ninety seven guys was the equivalent to purchasing power of about twenty six thousand two hundred six dollars and ninety five cents today. On this, and you'll have the run of Biloxi anytime you want it. So in March of nineteen eighty seven. Rhodes went to Biloxi and met with Ransom and a man named Pete. It was Pete who specifically asked Rhodes and Ransom to do the hit. Rhodes said he also met with Mike Gillis, the Biloxi strip club owner, who would supply. Ah, so you guys are seeing a spider web here of a bunch of different uh, conspirators. You got Mike Gillis, the strip club, uh, um, the strip club owner. You got the mayor, right? You got freaking Kirksey Nixon jail. You got these hitmen that are negotiating price. Uh, you got the girlfriend of Kirksey Nix that's helping with storing the money from the Lonely Heart scheme. So as y'all can see, this is a very complex um, investigation in using different components, different crimes, different individuals, different roles, etc. And my friends, this is organized crime at its finest. The money once the hit was done. But five months later, before they could do the job, Rhodes was arrested on an unrelated bank robbery charge. And Ransom got cold feet, afraid Rhodes would turn on him. Ah, uh, he knew too much, so he didn't want to commit the, the murder. The information helped the case inch forward, but Agent Bell and Officer Cook still felt that Ransom held the missing pieces. Another year would pass without much progress. In late 1990, the investigators went to the Bostick Correctional Institute in Georgia, where Ransom was serving time. Finally, Ransom agreed to talk. Hey, here we go. He admitted that he delivered a 22 caliber pistol to Larray Sharp, Kirksey Nix's girlfriend. 22 caliber is very uh, popular with hitmen, guys, because it's not as loud. It's easy to procure. And uh, weapons that you use, right, especially if you're going to do a headshot, it works perfectly. It's easier to silence as well. This is all in that hitman book. But Ransom insisted that he did not do the job. Based on what Ransom said, LeRae's involvement was starting to look bigger than simply stashing scam money in a safe Sorry. deposit box. Through his contact with Sharp, Nix learned that the investigation was heating up. He worried that his girlfriend might talk, so he tried to head off the problem by putting out a contract on her life. Oh, my man, cold blooded. <laughs> yeah, you want her to get that yeet? But in late 1990, Agent Bell arrested her for her participation in the murders, inadvertently saving her from Nix's gunman. During a polygraph test, Sharp denied her involvement in the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. Not but the, the machine cow. called her bluff. Not the cow. When Bell and his team added her statements to their existing stacks of evidence, they were ready to bring indictments against several key players. Women always fold, man. Uh, I'll tell you all this, man. When I, when I do my arrest, you always go after the girlfriends, man. They will snitch. And then the fact that he wanted her killed, bruh, definitely something to add to your repertoire when you interview her. Hey, this dude didn't care about you. You were storing his money. And he wanted you dead. What do you got to say to that? Okay, I'll tell you all everything. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Gillich because remember she's right in the middle guys she's dealing with the with the corrupt mayor the boss boyfriend in prison for murder she's storing the cash she's seeing the bag man she knows Gillich the strip club owner is the one sending the money so she's right in the middle of it man John Ransom, Ray Sharp and Kirksey Nix were charged as conspirators in the Sherry murders Notably missing from the list was Pete Halat. Pete Halat is the mayor, guys. The case against Halat would have to wait until they had enough evidence for a murder conviction. 
And not only that, you're going after the mayor. You don't want to mess that one up. You know, like I tell y'all before, federal prosecutors, the feds in general, rarely lose if ever. So if you get indicted, you're more than likely going to have to plead guilty to one of those charges on that indictment. So um, they want to make sure that they got their T's crossed, I's dotted when you go after a public official, especially a lawyer, a lawyer that is a mayor now. For now, the FBI would look to convict the others on conspiracy to commit murder. So many of the questions came up. Why didn't y'all indict Pete Hollett early on when you indicted everybody else? Well, at the time, we didn't have the hard evidence that you would have to have to arrest a mayor and prosecute him. The conspiracy trial produced several key witnesses that would help investigators piece together the complex scheme. Robbie Gant, Gillich's bagman for the Lonely Heart scam, testified for the prosecution. His testimony helped prosecutors link the Sherry murders to the scam. All four defendants were found guilty. Nix was given 15. That's an L for all of them. Bagman came forward. 15 years in addition to the life sentence he was already serving for murder. Gillich also received a 15 year prison term. Ransom got 10 years and the Ray Sharp won. Ah, the chick got one year, but that's how y'all know that she gave a lot of information. <laughs> She was probably the linchpin that got them all indicted and secured the convictions. That's why she only got one year. Get your hands in order. With these conspirators behind bars and the Lonely Heart scam no longer operational, Bell moved on to his next objective. We decided not to end the Sherry investigation after the 1991 uh, initial convictions because at that time we had not proven who had actually uh, shot the Sherry's. And also Pete Halat had not been indicted or convicted at that point. And we all felt strongly that Pete Halat had played a, ma a major role in the scam and in the murder plot. So we were determined to continue the investigation to see if we could get enough evidence to indict and convict Mr. Halat and the actual shooter. In late July of 1992, Agent Bell got the break he was looking for. Following the conspiracy trial, Mike Gillich was desperate to find a way out of prison. He contacted one of his associates in Biloxi Hello? and asked him to approach Robbie Gant with an offer. Okay, well, whatever you say. Gant told Agent Bell about it. And the associate had offered Robbie Gant $20,000 if Gant would recant his testimony against Gillich and sign a false affidavit stating that he had been threatened by me to testify against Gillich. Oh, uh, sh oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> These guys are don't, don't know when to quit uh, to testify falsely against Gillich. Gant agreed to wear a wire and get the offer from Gillich's accomplice on tape. Oh! <laughs> Man. Woo! Gant met with him in Mississippi. This time, Gant's tape was rolling when Gillich's associate reiterated the bribe. Gant accepted as Bell had instructed. Now, Bell had the evidence he needed to turn up the heat on Gillich. Just the man who could tell the story from the inside. By 1993, six years after the double murder of Vince and Margaret Sherry, FBI agent Keith Bell had put four members of the Dixie Mafia behind bars. 
but he still had no formal murder convictions against those involved. And Mayor Pete Halat, the suspected mastermind of the case, was still free and running the city of Biloxi. In fact, the year before, Mayor Halat had broken ground on the city's first big casino. The victory for our town and our people. The press still hounded Halat about his involvement in the Sherry murders, but he remained adamant. And as you guys know, right, Miss Sherry did not want casinos all over Biloxi. And about his innocence. And she wanted to be mayor. Bell continued to work his plan. He used the bribe Robert Gant had recorded on tape to level another charge against Mike Gillich, already in jail. Now Bell indicted Gillich for witness bribery and witness tampering for trying to buy off Gant. Oh, man. Now you're looking at even more time, bro. And that did the trick. No doubt the most important uh, turning point was in October of 1993, when Mike Gillich finally decided to cooperate and tell the story of this whole case from an insider's point of view. And that's what really uh, allowed us to bring final resolution to this investigation. After the years of painstaking work Bell had spent on the case, it was a satisfying moment. Finally, it seemed his patience and ingenuity were paying off. Gillich was in no hurry to accrue more jail time. Bell's relentless pressure had persuaded him to cut a deal before the bribery trial even began. Hey, there we go, baby. The Dixie Mafia member would tell what he knew about the murders. Mr. Gillich. Maybe now, Bell could get the convictions he knew were long overdue. Uh, I 18 USC 201, man, I, I, was, I had it right. Um... This is, guys, the charge that they probably hit him with, bribery of public officials, okay? This is more than likely that what they hit him on, okay? <laughs> oh, man. Big L. I remember when I was an agent myself, uh, anytime someone would try to bribe you, you know, you had to go ahead and call that to, you know, off Office of Professional Responsibility, a.k.a. Internal Affairs, immediately, and you know you you basically would bust the fucking guy for doing it so they take bribery pretty pretty seriously guys when it comes to the u.s government and federal agencies right because you're held to a higher standard you know which is why a lot of the times the feds typically investigate public corruption because it is so much harder to penetrate the feds than you know other levels of government now am i saying that it doesn't occur of course you know i did i covered a whole thing on robert hansen right the fbi agent that you know was basically paid by the Russians to spy and provide a bunch of information, probably the biggest uh, security leak in U.S. history. But um, but you guys got to remember that that's rare and extremely infrequent for uh, federal agents to be, uh, you know, susceptible to public corruption or to be paid off and bribed for shit. Now, that is not to say that there aren't lazy agents. There's a bunch of agents that don't do their job that are lazy as fuck. This is true. They don't fucking investigate as hard as they should or follow up all on leads, whatever. But you guys got to remember that laziness isn't necessarily corruption. There's a very fine line between the two. So, yeah, that was the L for this guy with the bribery. Not saying that corruption doesn't exist in the federal government. Definitely does. But it's not as prevalent as other levels of government. Or in other countries, for that matter. As much as people talk shit about the United States, we definitely do have rule of law to some degree versus other countries, which is why the U.S. dollar is um, obviously the reserve currency. That's a big part of being a reserve currency is having rule of law in your country, which is why Russia and China will never get it, you know, unfortunately. But for a career criminal, for them, of course, criminal like Mike Gillich, adjusting to life on the right side of the law wasn't easy. At first, he tried to bluff his way out. Of course, it always takes some time, a period of weeks, 
to develop some degree of uh, trust and to be able to uh, communicate with someone like this who for the first time has decided to leave his lifelong role as uh, a criminal and start cooperating with the FBI. When deception didn't work, Gillich had no alternative. He had to tell the truth. Now, for the first time, Bell heard the story from an inside source. Gillich knew all the details. Mike was the center point. Mike knew Kirksey Nix. Mike knew Pete Hallett for years. And in fact, when Kirksey Nix was looking for an attorney over in the coast area to represent him on various matters, Mike Gillich introduced Nix into Pete Hallett. He confirmed that Pete Hallett was indeed behind the plan to murder the Sherrys and that the plot grew directly out of the Lonely Heart scam of Angola prison inmate Kirksey Nix. Some months before the Sherry's deaths, Halat had closed the safe deposit box he and Nix's girlfriend, Larray Sharp, had access to, effectively cutting off her access to the money. He then transferred the money into a box only he and Judge Sherry could use. Motivated by greed, he stole $100,000 cash from there. Holy, we went over how much that actually is, guys. It's uh, over a quarter million. Well over double. 262000 uh, was $100,000 back in 1987. As Nix's trusted accomplice, Halat could blame the theft on Judge Sherry. Bam. Next, he went to Mike Gillich with news of the theft. Mr. Gillich stated that Pete Halat approached Mr. Gillich himself in late 1986 and told Mr. Gillich that much of the money was missing, supposedly around $100,000. And Mr. Alat blamed Judge Sherry for taking the money. Bam. Uh, Mr. Alat knew that Kirksey Nix would be very furious about this. It is not known who ordered Margaret's death, but as a fierce opponent of corruption, she posed a threat to the underworld forces hoping to control Biloxi. With Margaret dead, Halat could be free to run the town. And do what? Make a bunch of money, guys, okay? She clearly, y'all know that she didn't want the strip clubs the casinos, and all these other types of businesses in Biloxi. So that was a direct threat on Gillich, the strip club owner, because that affects his business. That's a direct threat to um, the guy who wanted to run for mayor. So he wants to make this money. He wants these businesses to come in because it creates more uh, revenue for the city in general. But she didn't want that. Gillich said that he and Halat planned the murders. Halat, my bad. Ransom and Rhodes provided the murder weapon. But when they passed on doing the hit, Gillich found a replacement, a Texas-based petty criminal named Thomas Holcomb. Bam, there's the last key. Remember, up to this point, we they had not known who the actual shooter was. Holcomb would be paid $20,000 to murder Judge Sherry and his wife. Gillich had also helped provide the car with the help of locksmith Lenny Sweatman. $20,000, guys, in 1987 is the equivalent purchasing power of $52,466.90 today. God damn. So he pretty much got well over 50 k to do this in today's money.
In October of 1996, agents arrested hitman Thomas Holcomb in Texas on murder charges. Peter, that same down. month Going also on. saw the arrest that Agent Bell had anticipated and worked nine years to achieve. You're an innocent man, and you're going to put the cuffs on the arrest of Peter Latt for the murders of the Sherrys. You can, uh, anything you say can and will be held against you. Kirksey Nix and LaRae Sharp were indicted on 52 counts, including fraud, money laundering, and murder. Alat was tried and convicted in the summer of 1997, a full decade after the crimes were committed. And that's the real footage right there, as y'all can see, there he is. He was sentenced to 18 years in federal prison. Also tried and convicted were Kirksey Nix and Thomas Holcomb, the hitman. Both were sentenced to life. LaRae Sharp, Nix's girlfriend, got five years. Bam. Only five years. God damn it. I think a lot of citizens in Biloxi she probably cooperated. See now realize that there are a lot of dedicated professional law enforcement people who will do everything they can to uh, protect the community and work hard to solve major crimes. Uh, perhaps the uh, legacy you might say of the case for the criminal element is that they realize after seeing this case that. They can commit a crime one day and think they're getting away with it a year later, but it could come back uh, 10 years later and get them. While the Sherry's killers were finally brought to justice, Margaret Sherry's dream of a Biloxi free of gambling was never realized. Instead, Biloxi has become a resort town filled with casinos and neon lights. The sleepy southern town is gone forever, along with the woman who lost her life trying to save it. Yeah. Now, guys, just so you guys know, Pete Halat, here he is, right? Um, he's still alive. Um, he actually <laughs> got out of prison not too long ago. Well, actually, about a decade ago. He got released uh, in 2013 after serving 15 years, nine months, and seven days in jail at the age of 70 years old. And here's obviously his co-conspirators. You got here uh, Kirksey McCord Nix Jr., right? We know he's he's serving life in prison at the Federal Correction Institute in, at El Reno, Oklahoma. And uh, Mike Gillich died of cancer in 2012. Thomas Leslie Holcomb, a Texas-based contract killer, was convicted of carrying out the killings and died in prison in 2005. John Ransom and Sherry LeSherry Sharp were both convicted in 1991 on federal conspiracy charges related to the two murders. Ransom was a Dixie Mafia hitman who supplied the gun used in murders of Vincent and Margaret Sherry. Sharp was Kirksey Nix's girlfriend who worked as a legal aide and helped him run his Lonely Hearts dating scam while he was in prison. The scam involved placing fraudulent ads in the national LGBT magazine. The advocate pretended to be young, single, homosexual men in le legal trouble who needed money. Okay, and then obviously this episode we just broke down, 1999. Okay, I, 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 uh, I thought it was in the year 2000, but yeah, 1999. Um, but yeah, it's Pete Halat right here, guys. So he's live. He's 80 years old. Um, he was elected mayor in 1989, lost the re-election in 1993. The FBI investigation eventually ended up this, ended the city's long tolerance for wide-open illegal gambling and stripped these clubs with uh, exorbitantly priced drinks, the purchase of which served as a front for prostitution. 1997, Halat was convicted for his involvement in a criminal conspiracy which led to the 1987 murders of Halat's former law partner, Mississippi Judge Vincent Sherry and Sherry's wife, Margaret, a Biloxi City Councilwoman. He was found guilty and sentenced to 18 years in prison, of which he served a 15. So, uh, yeah, guys, that is the episode. Uh, Christina, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, let me go ahead. He, <laughs> he honestly just messed up when he said both of them were dead at the door. Like <laughs> That was kind of an L, actually. That was... Just, <laughs> that right there just got everything. Yeah, like, yeah, that was you kind of... You literally just messed up. You could have been like, oh, my God, is he dead? Or, like, he could have been like, call the police, call the police. Yeah, like, screaming, he's like, they're both dead. Went outside was like the both dead. And and the thing that made it crazier was that she was all the way on the on the other side of the house. So like, bro, how would you know that? <laughs> like, that right there is just yeah, uh, red flag. El halat right there, El halat. Yeah. But anyway. Guys,
guys, hope you enjoyed that episode, man. Uh, we it's been a while since we did a public corruption episode, man. You guys actually requested this one. I, I saw quite a few people say, "Yo, cover the Dixie Mafia, Dixie Mafia, Dixie Mafia." Y'all got what you asked for. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I'll be back with another episode, probably to cover the FDX scam, uh, with your boy Sam Friedman, whatever his name is, and uh, yeah, and I also cover the school shootings from the university out there in the Midwest as well. But uh, Christina, any last words for the people? Um, just contact Feta eighteen eleven if you want any cases to be done and your location because we do need people in different states. Bam! So. All right, cool. Hope you guys enjoy that, man. I'll catch you guys in the next episode of Fit It. Peace. Love y'all as always, man. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations. Okay, guys, HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Fed it covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of two murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, six nine. And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, six nine ran. With I'm a Fed. I'm